All right. Hi, everyone. Um, so we're going to talk now about making changes to the structure of our databases. So um, schema changes, database migrations, whatever you want to call them. So the title of this talk is just a Futurama reference. Don't want you to actually feel bad. Hope you're having a good time at the conference. And hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll feel marginally better about database migrations than you did before. The other thing I want to apologize for in advance is for my voice. I've got quite a strong New Zealand accent, but maybe if you've seen like Flight of the Concords before or anything, you'll uh, have a better time understanding me. Anyway, um, well, <laughs> we'll get started, and uh, I, thought we'd, I thought we'd begin with an inspirational quote. So this is Linus Torvalds talking about the importance of uh, structuring data correctly. Now, Linus Torvalds can sometimes be a bit of a rude guy, and so I'm not a, I'm not a fan of his tone sometimes, but I'm a big fan of what he's saying here. Uh, worrying about the structure of your Thinking about uh, data structures and relationships and giving them prime importance over your code is absolutely important. Uh, so I probably don't need to say this at, at, at a uh, database conference, but structure, yeah, we all know the importance of uh, getting our data structures right. And it's not just important for, um, for us uh, DBAs and back-end developers. Uh, it's important for the front end. Uh, on the front end, what most people want is reliability, they want responsiveness, and you don't get that without a well-structured database and a well-functioning backend. And if you're at the keynote yesterday, you probably heard Paul Vixie uh, talk about the importance of not letting your schema go stale and keeping it nice and clean and well-structured. Unfortunately, um, working with schema changes is hard. Every time you want to make a, da a database change when you're working with your app, it seems, seems a little bit harder than it needs to be. And it seems even harder to go and roll it out and put it into production. It's just not intuitive, even if you're just changing like a column or two. It's kind of error prone, a bit stressful, and just not a great time. And in fact, I have this pet theory that the whole reason for the sudden rise in the popularity of NoSQL databases a few years back is that uh, people just got into them because they hated dealing with schema changes. So, no SQL databases, for the most part, they don't, they don't enforce much of a, a schema on your data. You can kind of save data into it without thinking about your schema much. And I think that advantage alone was enough to get lots of developers to, uh, to use these databases. And so maybe that's misguided because uh, stuff like Mongo is terrible and you should never use it. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's, it's forgivable because it is, uh, it is difficult, a completely understandable reaction. The thing is, in most cases, uh, you want a, a strongly enforced schema. Uh, fundamentally, a schema is a guarantee that your data conforms to the structure you intend. And being able to guarantee that is a really good thing. We don't want to go and uh, throw that advantage away. So if the tools aren't great, though, how can we make them better? So let's take a look at the way the tools work now, uh, think about the problems, and then uh, think about maybe how to fix them. So you might have worked with one of these before. So Rails migrations. I think Rails kind of kicked off the trend of how most of the tools work now. Um, but you might have used Django or Lambic. Um, pretty much every language seems to have an equivalent. And what's common to almost all of them, so every time you want to make a database change, you create a migration file. Each migration file gets a version number. And that, that tells you where you're up to in terms of the development of your schema. Trouble is that over time, you build up a whole lot of these files, and you wind up with a directory that looks something like this. It's not very nice. It's kind of cluttered. There's a lot of files in there. And the trouble is that most of the time, these files are totally irrelevant. It's very unlikely that you want to go back to a version of your database and your app from like three months ago. If you're anything like me, you're probably kind of embarrassed about the code you wrote three months ago. You never want to see it again. And why would you ever go back to that? So uh, we already have pretty well established tools for working with version control. And um, so why not just use those tools? Why keep these old migration files uh, hanging around, uh, cluttering up the working copy of your code? The other problem is that every time you need to make a change, you have to make a new file. It's kind of a heavyweight process. 
the assumption is that you know maybe you know once a month or something you'll go through the process, and it's kind of a kind of a heavyweight thing to do, and. I feel that kind of goes against the, the whole modern ethos of software development. You want to do some rapid prototyping, especially if you're in the early stages of a project. You want to add a column here, add a column there, change your mind, and this just makes it way too hard. So a further problem is testability. There's a, there's a lot of things to, uh, to worry about when you're making a migration, a lot of things that can go wrong. and um, there's a lot of questions to answer. Does our development schema currently match what's on live? Do we know that? What about our test schema? Uh, maybe we just deployed a migration and updated our database, but do we know that it matches our development version? Is our migration going to run successfully? We don't know that. Um, how long is our migration going to take to run? Uh, will we get any downtime? Will we get any errors if we don't uh, run our app deployment and our migration at exactly the same time? The usual answer is, is that we don't know. Most people just kind of write their migrations, do their deployment, they hope for the, hope for the best. Um, it's, kind of possible to, uh, it's kind of possible to test for these things, but you've got to write a lot of custom code. In practice, most people don't have time for it. Further problem is framework lock-in. So um, when, you're, when you're using uh, one of these uh, migration frameworks, you're usually stuck with the object relational mapper that goes along with that framework. And that's all very well, but um, why should those two things be coupled together? Um, I don't want to wade into the ongoing debate about whether object relational mappers are good or bad or which one's the best, but the right tool should be available to you um, regardless of how you're otherwise in interacting with your database. Really, we want to completely uncouple the two and have them work separately. The other problem is that these tools assume you're using them to manage the entire database, and they also assume you're, you, you're, you've been using them from day one to manage the database. Say so you, so you want to make a one-off schema change to a database that you haven't been uh, using Django with before, you've got to spend a whole lot of time retrofitting Django's models onto, onto that database schema before you can take advantage of um, Django's migration features. The other problem is that all these tools t uh, treat the database as uh, a primitive table store and nothing more. So SQL has come a long way since the 90s, but it seems like we're still only taking advantage of its most basic features. Again, I probably don't need to tell you this at Postgres conference, but Postgres has some pretty cool features. You might have heard about them over the last day or so, and uh, it'd be nice to take advantage of that and have them be supported by our migration tools. But usually even, even fairly basic stuff like views is not handled by most migration frameworks and you're kind of on your own as soon as you move beyond tables. So I want to stop complaining and actually think about how we could solve these problems and improve the situation. So first problem we need to look at is the status quo with uh, this, this long sequence of schema versions. So how can we improve on this situation and kind of simplify this? Well, Really, there's only ever uh, three schema versions we're thinking about. Obviously, we've got our production schema. Uh, that's, that's kind of important uh, for obvious reasons, kind of self-evident. Then we've got our development schema. So every so often we do a deploy, our development schema becomes our live schema. Uh, we work on that, we make changes to that. Uh, we deploy in, in a cycle. And then the empty schema is obviously pretty important because we need to be able to um, set up our development environment and um, develop our schemas. But those are really the only three things we worry about. Anytime we're thinking about schemas, we're usually thinking of them in these terms. The next problem is the, the concept of migration files and version numbers. So like I was saying before, these are kind of heavyweight. They're kind of annoying. Maybe there's something more straightforward and direct that we can use to uh, rep represent migrations and, and uh, to work with migrations. And so we're all pretty familiar with diffs. Uh, most of us probably use uh, Git in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, and diffs are a pretty ubiquitous concept. So obviously diffs can be used for almost anything, text, maps, a whole lot of things. And we've all seen them before. So this is what, kind of what a text diff looks like. So old text, new text, 
but we can also represent schema changes as diffs. So in the case of a database, a, uh, a database diff is simply the list of statements that's required to move from uh, one state of a database to a different state. And so here we might have one database that uh, has an author table without a data, date of birth column and another one that does, and this simply represents the, the difference between them. So if we apply that statement to one database, uh, we'll get a database with the structure of the other database. So it's totally, it's totally the same equation as with any other diff. Old plus diff equals new. And so I thought it was such a good uh, idea to have a, uh, a diff tool for databases that I wrote one that supports Postgres, and it's a command line tool and a Python library. And I figured the, the um, best way to look at how it works is with some examples. So we'll get straight into that. So let's, let's assume we have database A and we have database B. So we go into B, we create a basic table, the table is called T, all it's got is an ID and a name. So what we can do is on the command line, we have first connection string, second connection string, we run the command, and what we get here is a, um, a decomposed version of the uh, create table that we wrote before. So at the moment, A is empty, B contains all this stuff, and this is simply the set of statements that gets you from A to B. So that's the, uh, that's the fundamental uh, concept of how the tool works. But let's think about a more full example where you might use this to run a, a migration on an actual production schema. So the first thing you need to think about is, is your goal schema. So that's usually like the schema that you've got in development. Um, and that can be defined however you want. Sometimes you might just have setup scripts for it if you're not using an object relational mapper, but you can just uh, load it from your models, whatever. So you decide on that. Um, so let's say, for example, we have this as our goal schema. So this is just a setup script. We've got an author and a book table, so this is what we want our database to look like. So again, we load that into database B. Then what we do is we take our current live schema. So this is what our database looks like right now. And so we use pgdump. We dump only the schema. We don't worry about, about uh, dumping the data. We load that into A, and then we compare our current database, which was what we've got in production that we just dumped, and then we've got our goal schema, and we compare the two. So again, we get some output. You can see on production, it looks like we didn't have a book table before. We just had an author table, but there's been some changes to the author column as well. Looks like we've changed the data type on the date of birth column. And so that's all been picked up by the tool. And this is the output we need to move from one to the other. What we can do then is um, put that output in a migration script, apply it to A, and we can confirm that our script matches uh, by running the command again and comparing one database to the other. Now, as with most diff tools, when you run a diff on two identical files, you get empty output. So if we get empty output, then we've confirmed that the database matches. What you'll then do is review the file. Uh, it's not fully automatic, so if there's data that you need to take out of old tables first before you drop them, then you would obviously add that to your file. You might want to move some data around. Uh, af after, the, after the changes have happened, you might want to copy some data into the, into the new columns or the new tables you've just created. But when you're done, when you're editing, when you're, when you're happy that it's going to work, you apply that to uh, production and your migration has been applied. So that kind of works. Um, next example we might look at is uh, auto-syncing. So you've got, a, you've got a database in development, you're, you're editing your setup scripts, and um, you don't want to drop and recreate the database every time. You just want to have a database running on your local machine while you're developing so that you can, um, so that you can work with your, uh, the, the latest database version and test your app out on that. So using, using Migra as a, um, as a Python library this time, here's how we might script up something like that. 
So this, this, um, this script uses a few snippet, snippets. So S is simply creating a database session, and we've got a um, Python context manager that creates a temporary database. And so what we do first, so we create this temporary database, uh, we load up our goal schema into the temporary database, and then there's this migration object, which is where most of the magic happens. So that takes two uh, database connections, uh, takes the current schema, so that's your, um, that's your development database you've got running on your local machine, and then there's the goal schema, which we just created in our temporary database. So then what we do is uh, this add all changes, um, detects all the changes between those two schemas, and then once we've uh, added all the changes, uh, all the statements that are required to move from one to the other um, appear in this um, statements attribute. So then we can uh, print out the changes that are pending. Um, so m.sql is just the string version of the list of statements. Prompt to see whether we want to apply them. If we want to apply them, um, press yes, and suddenly they're applied. That means what we can do is um, we can keep on developing uh, our schema matches, and we don't need to faff around creating new migration files, bumping the version numbers, checking what version number we're up to. Um, it all just kind of works. So it's fast enough to uh, keep you in your flow, and you, you don't need to get distracted by these kind of irrelevant busy work tasks. So next thing we want to look at is testing. I was, I was saying before there's kind of lack of testing with database migrations. And so if you're running a production site, ideally what you want to do is make sure that your app works with both uh, the before and after version of your database. That way you can roll out your app. At your leisure, you can uh, run your schema changes, and um, you'll know that the app works both before and after. But most people, most people kind of skip that step because they're doing their migrations uh, as part of their deployment process. Usually there's only a few seconds between them, so they kind of run the migration, run the deploy, and, uh, and again, ho hope for the best and just kind of accept that there's going to be a few errors along the way. But it'd be much better if we could uh, guarantee that our, our app was going to work before and after. So that's kind of easy to do in, in Python. Um, so if we adopt the convention that we have any pending changes that we've generated in, uh, in a pending.sql file, you can simply check that file, see if it's got anything in it. If there are pending changes, what we do here is we set up uh, two, two fixtures for our tests. So uh, we have a pre-migration state, we have a post-migration state, and um, this setup down the bottom here uh, with PyTest fixtures uh, runs the test on both fixtures. So this means that in our test suite, if we have any uh, pending changes at all, Every test in our test suite that uses this fixture, fixture is going to get run twice. And so as long as our tests pass, um, we know that our code is going to be uh, stable both before and after. So um, because, because we're not relying on version numbers, because we're, um, because we're directly um, checking that the schemas match, because we're testing before and after, that makes migrations uh, a lot more trustable. And we get independence from our framework. Um, we don't have to worry about uh, which, which object relational mapper we're using. We can use a variety of them, several at the same time, none at all. We can use extra Postgres features that aren't supported by our, by our object relational mapper because uh, we're talking directly to the database. We're not, we're not talking th through an object relational mapper. And so um, this, this tool at the moment only supports Postgres, but you could, uh, you, could, you could quite easily develop it for other databases as well. And so there's no reason it can't work with um, any um, SQL stack you're working on. Um, so I have um, links to a, a sample app and, and the code for this tool. And there's some uh, pretty rudimentary docs um, but that about sums it up. Um, anyone got any questions? Um, does, it, does it handle changes to the underlying code of user functions? 
It does, yeah. So um, if you change your user function, uh, it detects the change in the definition, detects changes in parameters, and it will do like a, a like a drop and recreate. And, and same with view also. Same with views, yeah. Um, if, if I'm understanding your question correctly, it's, it's connecting directly to the databases and just looking at the state that exists like right now. So whatever, whatever you load up and connect to, that's the state it will look at and it will generate the appropriate changes. But it will pick up the, the um, change in column type. Uh, what do you mean more concretely? No, so it's purely looking at the structure of your of your tables and the and the database objects. So not looking at the data within them. I suppose you could you could add features for that, but like I wanted to keep the tool kind of focused on on the one particular thing. Yeah, or I look at we have developers who have um, changed the pivot sometimes to change the actual data to their pull request or to their database migration to something else. It'll like basically um, like make a lookup table and it'll feed it just like ten basic rows. Yeah, I guess the idea with this tool is um, like it doesn't enforce a particular workflow on you, so it kind of uh, automates like a lot of the busy work stuff, but you can still kind of customize it however you want depending on how you're used to doing things and um, populate it with data um, at, at whatever time, whatever. Yeah, right. So it's only if you've got um, changes that are, that are pending. If you're just deploying code, then it's like it's going to pick that up. Um, yeah. So back here, um, if there's no pending changes, then it only loads the the one particular state, and so your tests are only running once. So it's only running an extra set of tests when when it actually needs to. Yeah, I guess this tool doesn't, um, like it doesn't enforce a particular uh, workflow on your deployment wise. So one thing you do have to check is that what you're, what you're deploying um, actually matches the production schema that you've tested against. So for instance, um, where, where I've used this in production before, um, we, we, we run a step where we check that, um, that the migration that's about to be applied is applied on the same version that was used to generate it. And so, if, um, if anything looks wrong, then it will kind of abort the whole process and not even attempt the migration. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. uh, so you would only check in you would only check in the one file. Um, so you would check in your pending file, and um, what I was talking about before with testing if the migration needs to be applied. So if you want to do your migrations at the same time as you do a deploy, um, just have a step that checks if it's already been applied. Um, if it has already been applied, then it will get ignored and you can, you can throw it away at, at any point.
Uh, so in the, in the example, I used a um, temporary database. And so literally, you, you just create one, load it from the dump, um, do the comparison, and then throw it away at the end. So, so you can do that. Um, the, the only issue is um, you actually need like a production dump of your schema. And depending on your operational constraints, um, that, that can sometimes be a challenge if you've got uh, uh, you know, control freak sysadmins who won't, uh, won't let you touch production. So um, you've got to figure out how you're going to get an updated version of that and keep it updated. So I guess the disadvantage is that um, you, you require, um, like it's a, bit more, it's a bit more complex in terms of um, needing production dumps, but um, you get a lot of value out of that in terms of knowing that, uh, that your um, migration is going to be correct and actually run correctly against production. Any other? Yeah, how do you get your object dependencies done in the correct order? Uh, like if you drop a table that's pointed to by some foreign key, do you have to drop the foreign key first, then drop the table? Yeah, so. Are you relying on PG dump to get the stuff in order? And then no, so this doesn't use PG dump. Um, probably most of the complexity in, in developing this is making sure it spits the statements out in the correct order. So, um, like it drops most of the things it doesn't need anymore then does the table creates and then creates all the dependencies in the right order. It does do, um, does do function dependencies in the right order, but there's some, there's some minor limitations because Postgres uh, doesn't, as far as I'm aware, track, um, track function dependencies, even though it does kind of enforce them. So it uses, um, it just searches for mentions of that function name and definitions of others and uses that to generate the correct dependency order. But yeah, there's some, um, I guess one of the downsides of SQL is it's quite, um, it's quite fiddly in terms of the order that you um, drop and create things. So, yeah, I think most of the time it does the right thing. Uh, I'm not aware of any, any problems with the, uh, with the order that it generates the output in at the moment, but um, if you run into any, uh, let me know. Any other questions? So I'm just looking at the um, at the system tables. Um, so really, just directly querying them. So play, most of the grunt work is um, some fairly um, fairly long SQL queries that um, just put the like the names of each database entity into a table, uh, along with all their details, and then those get um, those get compared within Python. So. Yeah, most of the grunt work, it'd be, it'd be quite easy to port to other languages because most of the grunt work is happening in SQL queries, which you could just directly copy and run in any language. Anything else? Okay. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>